this is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com as we're taking a look ahead at week five of college football and the betting landscape and letting you know the best numbers on the board with Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus. My name is Jim Sonnes. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Ed Fang of the PowerRank.com. And Ed, we got another guy with a PhD on today. You are Dr. Ed Fang. So we got two guys with a PhD and then another guy who was a stats major for a week and decided it was not for him. So I'm feeling a little <laughs> bit uh, outmatched here. Well, you know, I mean, the only thing I can say about that is like you managed to pick the two PhDs that can put a sentence together. So <laughs> got lucky in, in that department. But uh, no, 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 Jim, we need guys like you to get the word out about all the all the good analytics and uh, yeah. make good bets. I'm excited to talk to Eric, too, because he has done awesome work uh, with talking about quarterbacks and offensive linemen. And I, like, I played offensive line in high school. It's such a stupid thing to say. But, like, as a person who played offensive line in high school, I would like not some of the blame to not be on people like me every now and then. <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk with Eric about his research there. Uh, we'll talk about also week five of college football, pro football focus, green line as well. And, Ed, you've talked to Eric before, and I think that the research he has done into – you know, pass rush versus pass coverage and, you know, quarterbacks and their sack rate is just so fascinating. And it's it's necessary to have stuff like that that kind of calls into question our assumptions. Yeah. And, and the thing is, like, I don't think he meant to go in and check all our assumptions about how right. we watch the game. It's just you dig into the data, you ask some interesting questions, and sometimes things will shock you. Like, you know, running is not very effective in the NFL <laughs> compared to passing. You know, none of us went, none of us tried to find that answer you know right. it, it's just uh you know people who do awesome work like dr eric eager just they dig into the data and uh you see what pops up and you do good analysis and he certainly does and we'll bring it in uh dr eric eager in just one second you can follow him on twitter at pff underscore eric he of course is a data scientist for pro football focus talk with him in just one second tomorrow on the podcast we're going to bring whale capper back to break down week four of the nfl season and his favorite bets on the board to get that podcast right as it is posted make sure you subscribe to the the covering the spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, the Google Play Store, iHeartRadio. It's everywhere. You can find it, believe me. And while you're there, leave a rating and review as well. Before we bring in Dr. Eric Eager, we got to look back to last week, though. And Ed, got to give you some kudos for your call about Notre Dame's game against Georgia. That's coming up next. Covering the past. All right, last week on the College Football Edition of Covering the Spread, we had Kelly Stewart on. Uh, we had, in that game, Texas A&M, or in that podcast, Texas A&M minus 3.5. Auburn, really impressive there. They won that game outright. BYU plus 6.5. Washington kind of laid the hammer on that one, too. Uh, Louisville minus 6.5. Florida State did wind up covering that game. I think it was 7 points, I, I believe. Uh, but... Florida State did cover there. Oklahoma State plus seven. They did cover that one. They were playing Texas. Really close game, 36 to 30 there. So Oklahoma State get, did cover. Kentucky plus five and a half. I don't know if we had the quarterback news with Kentucky at that point, uh, but they lost that one by 15. So, you know, we'll start there, but for sure. But Ed, you redeemed the podcast by talking about Notre Dame against Georgia. The spread at the time we recorded was plus 14. Uh, Notre Dame came out, and I think a big part of this was kept it low scoring. And it's hard to cover a 14-point spread when it's a low scoring game, but Notre Dame also played really well in that game. Yeah, I did think they played really well. I, I thought you could watch the first quarter of that game and feel like Notre Dame was on the same level athletically. Yeah. They weren't scared. And I felt pretty comfortable about that game in the first quarter. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously got a little nervy towards the end when Notre Dame hadn't scored for a couple a while in the second half and, and it looked and Georgia certainly did have a chance to cover. And I, I don't know if I said this last week, but I should have. Like I believe Georgia is the third best team in the nation. Yeah. Like there's nothing to shake that. Uh right. I just felt like the line was a little bit of a disrespect to Notre Dame. I feel like that's what we saw. So I'm happy to count it as a win. You know, I think a lot of betters out there could be like, Hey man, that game got to sixteen. You got two minus two points of closing line value. So that's a loss. <laughs> um, you know, it was weird and I respect, you know, closing line value is a very important thing to look sure. at, 
Uh, I answered, you know, field a bunch of questions on Twitter about why my numbers like Notre Dame so much. Uh, and I was just like, I just, I just think that line's wrong. Um, you know, win against it. I, I, I don't want to come on here every week. <laughs> you know, if, I don't want to come on here every week and, and have such bad closing value, but, uh, right. I did think it was the right side and I'll take it. And I also think like the movement there is indicative of kind of what we talked about both with Kelly and with you, where people are so sour on Notre Dame against tough opponents, given what they've seen on these high profile stages. And both you and Kelly mentioned that as being part of a reason why Notre Dame maybe wasn't getting the respect that they deserved there. And I think that that also feeds into that, that late movement because who are people going to be betting late? You know, it's a lot of people who may not be digging into the numbers as much. So you're going to see a lot of public money go against Notre Dame yeah. late in games like that. So I, I don't think it was surprising that the line moved after we talked about it. And I don't think it's an indictment of you that it did either. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I've, I've been kind of under the assumption that public money is not going to move a line two points like that on a Saturday. Yeah. You know, that it's some kind of sharp action. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I guess like talking to Bud, Bud Elliott of, of SB Nation and Banner Society has like influenced me to think that the sharp people are in early. You know, the the, sure. the limits are lower. Um, but I still think that if you are someone who's laying a lot of money, you probably want to get in pretty early. Um, right. So I guess like I have within my own process, I use like I use line in lines and line movement in DFS as well. I have grown more skeptical of late movement than I used to be, uh, kind of because of that. Um, so yeah. I thought it was pretty sharp to be a Notre Dame, uh, plus 14, regardless of the line set. And Kelly mentioned that she thought that they were being underappreciated as well. Oklahoma State plus seven, too. Uh, Spencer Sanders for Oklahoma State. I think he's not like someone I'm like uh, falling over to watch yet, but he's a pretty fun little guy to watch. You know, he's a freshman yeah. for Oklahoma State. He's been a pretty efficient passer. He can run quite a bit too. So yeah. Oklahoma State's gonna be a fun team to watch. They always are. Uh, yeah, but I'm interested in them for sure. Yeah, for sure. I, I I completely agree with you. I thought I felt pretty good about that game. Um, I was really really was hoping that Oklahoma State would pull off the win. Yeah. Uh, just because I have that Texas under nine wins, and <laughs> you know, like part of that belief was that they were gonna drop one of these games. Right. Um, they couldn't. They couldn't get quite get it done. That's fine. Uh, Texas offense has been good. Mm-hmm. But the thing to know about those ga- that game is that Texas lost a couple starters in their secondary. Right. And that is really bad for a defense that has struggled. And it's also the reason I really like to bet unders in college football win totals. Right. Is, you know, it's just so much more likely that some injuries are going to affect a team than you know you get a quarterback that's amazing that we didn't expect or something right um so yeah that that was a that was uh something to note if you are looking at that texas next couple weeks yeah and so ed kudos to you on notre dame against georgia we did talk about wisconsin versus michigan you was you said to me before we started talking that you wanted to touch on this game obviously wisconsin steamrolled here but but you wanted to yep. reevaluate part of your process yeah, definitely part of the process. I mean, I'm I'm not, um, you know, I I, I I said I liked Michigan. I don't necessarily want to. I'm, I'm not going back on that based on sure. what we knew before that game. Uh, but one thing I had told people was like, oh, Wisconsin hasn't hasn't played anyone. Sure. And while that's true, that ignores the fact that they just obliterated teams that they did play, and that is mm-hmm. predictive. And I was wrong to just say Wisconsin hasn't played anyone. Um, I should know better. Uh, I'm. <laughs> the one that wrote a ton about how just predictive raw margin of victory is back in the day right. when we were trying to get rid of the BCS. And, um, you know, I think my bias has played a role in that. Obviously, against Michigan, uh, I live here in Ann Arbor. And I promise not to make the same mistake with Ohio State, who is also obliterating people. And we, <laughs> we, we can't just say that they haven't played anyone, even though right. they haven't. And we talked about that before they played Indiana. And then they Blew the doors off of Indiana, too. Um, or at least I did. I talked about that. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's interesting to mention, too. Wisconsin plays Northwestern this week, and I plan to not watch that game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I saw um, I saw the SP Plus projections uh, for that. Uh, yeah, from Bill- what was it? 40-4, it, to four, um, and oh. that seems right. No, that no, seems no, right. No, I'm- <laughs> I mean, the spread is 26 now, right? It's 24 and a half. Oh, okay. Uh, it hasn't gotten- but it's okay. at Camp Randall. Um, I'm just going to really try hard not to watch that game. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, so to put this in perspective, I mean, you have to tip your cap to Wisconsin and what they did last week. Uh, they played really well, you know, pushing a perfect type game for them, no turnovers. Mm-hmm. They're not going to play that well every week. 
And for example, right. like, you know, Jack Cohen, they, they went for it on fourth and three near, near midfield. Kudos to Paul Chris for making that call. But Michigan got pressure on him, and he had to make essentially a perfect throw, uh, fade throw to the sideline, and he did it. And that's not going to happen every right. week. Um, uh, I will take my chances pressuring Jack Cohen on fourth and three any day, any week, any Saturday of the year. Absolutely. Still going to go ahead and uh, just not watch that game on Saturday. <laughs> and if you want to get in on the action, maybe bet Wisconsin minus 24 and a half. Check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey or Pennsylvania or at one of the many retail sportsbooks as well. Gambling problem? Call one 800 Gambler. Let's bring on Dr. Eric Eager now of Pro Football Focus. He is a data scientist for them. You can find him on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric in preview week five of college football. Covering the present. Let's bring Dr. Eric Eager into covering the spread. You can find his work over at Pro Football Focus where he is a data scientist. And Eric, it's awesome to have you on the show here today. How you doing? I'm really good. It's always fun to talk uh, talk football and talk college football specifically. Absolutely. We're going to talk plenty of college football with you, and I'm pretty excited that we'll get to talk about one of uh, your old schools in Nebraska, as they have a, a decently big game coming up on Saturday. But first, we're talking college football today, but I also, I, you know, we've got you on this podcast, and Eric, you've done a lot of research into the role that quarterbacks play in taking sacks. And if I'm going to have you on this podcast, I'm going to take advantage and talk to you about this study. You talked about it with Ed on his podcast, uh, but for people who didn't listen to that podcast, what have you found yourself when looking into the relationship between a quarterback and his sack totals? Yeah, and I know, you know, you've done great work in offensive line play. I think that I've heard about that on Ed's podcast uh, before as well. And, so, and it, you know, offensive line play is such an intricate thing. Uh, and so, and, and I think we at PFF do a pretty good job of grading those guys. And so it was a little bit like unsatisfying slash surprising to see that, you know, when you look at quarterbacks, uh, and, and their pressure rates, it carries regardless of, you know, uh, the, the starters on the offensive line, team to team, t- to a decent degree, scheme to scheme. So if you mm-hmm. switch offensive coordinators, we've just found that pressure rate uh, and sack rate is something that quarterbacks carry with them uh, a great deal. Uh, and, you know, it's just another reason why, you know, quarterbacks are king. They sort of control everything. Uh, and we found, you know, it, it, a lot has to do with, you know, time to throw. But some of it is just like, you know, basic pocket presence, the tendency to throw quickly, uh, like, you know, Drew Brees or wait forever in the pocket like Deshaun Watson. Uh, it's something that's a very much a quarterback trait. Absolutely. And yeah. I think that you, when you watch football, you kind of, you know, you pick up on that and you look at the data between Joe Flacco's sack rate last year versus Lamar Jackson's did not a lot changed up front, but those sack rates were wildly yeah. different. So when you're looking at, you know, sack numbers, can you, how much of that can you assign to the offensive line? Or when you're evaluating an offensive line, do you have to try to toss those numbers out entirely? Uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's, it's necessarily tossing those numbers out, but it, it, it's something where you look at it and I think you probably want to create a model that gives you the weights Uh, and, and, you know, off could, because you do see, like we were talking about Baker Mayfield off air and it, you know, he's got an offensive line full of players who are not particularly good. They traded away a starting guard in the off season for a defensive end. And so he, you know, he's probably responsible for a great deal of his pressure, but it might be as a result of him is, you know, the prior in his head being like, okay, these guys aren't very good. I need to make things happen on my own. Uh, And that's, and that's something you have to factor in. Same thing with Russell Wilson. We always talked about Wilson, uh, you know, with his, uh, a pension for sort of taking forever in the pocket uh, because and taking a lot of sacks and pressure because Seattle's offensive line was bad. But now Seattle's offensive line is, you know, not terrible anymore. And he's still doing a lot of the same things he used to do before. Uh, and so I think it matters certainly on the edges. And especially when you don't know a lot about a quarterback, the offensive line will, will you know, carry, I think, a, a, a decent amount of weight and prediction. Um, but, you know, the the guy's pressure rate that he takes on and then eventually, you know, his volatility as a quarterback as a result is certainly something I think the quarterback is the primary weight in your models. Yeah, Eric, I mean, after talking uh, to you on my podcast, like I, I feel like it's almost completely changed the way that I watch football. 
Uh, we, we watched Shea Patterson get really tentative in the pocket at Michigan. Yeah. Uh, we talked about that. And then, uh, you know, there was a pass on, you know, on the Thursday night game where Mariota, it, it's tough to see what the quarterback sees usually on a television broadcast, but sometimes you get a glimpse. And there was one play action that Mariota had that the guy was open and he, he just for some reason didn't pull the trigger. And these are the, you know, and and with Patterson, I'm trying to figure out because like I'm just viewing the game so differently after we talked that maybe I wasn't accurately looking at him last year in the same way. But definitely, yeah, all the credit in, in the world to you for and to, you know, using analytics to to make people watch the game differently. Yeah, I, I think a great deal. And, and thanks for the kind words. Honestly, the the, the idea is, you know, we in the broadcast angle, you do like obscure a lot. And we started to see different broadcast angles on, on, you know, especially Sunday night football, but Thursday night football, and, and we're getting more of a glimpse of what the quarterback sees. And it's, it's in a, you know, it, it, on top of it, it's also this idea of like, okay, does pressure affect a quarterback more or less than coverage? And sometimes now we're seeing, you know, historically, we always saw Lawrence Taylor coming off the edge on the left tackle on your TV. And that was what caused the offense to go kaput. But now we're starting to see a little bit more, you know, corners taking away a quarterback's first read and him holding on to the ball too long and then the pressure coming in. And it looks like, you know, just the defense is swarming him on a play when in reality, you know, there's the, the little guys on the back end are making plays so that the big guys up front can can uh, can make their money. And that's another yeah. research you've done is the value of a pass rush versus coverage, too. So a lot of great research that Eric has done. So make sure to check that out over Pro Football Focus. And also over while you're at PFF, you can check out Greenline. And Eric, you write up picks for Pro, Pro Football Focus with the help of Greenline. So for people who haven't used it before, can you explain what Greenline is and how it factors into your weekly process for college football specifically? Yeah, I, well, so this is the first year we had, you know, uh, Green Line, which is, you know, basically you look at it and it's a dashboard for, you know, where the consensus lines are and then using our grade data as well as, you know, as you would know, rest and, uh, you know, whether or not they're playing an in-conference game and all that kind of stuff, you know, where our numbers would sit. And then um, on top of that, we we write a column every week. I, I write an NFL one with my colleague, George Shahuri, and then my colleague, Ben Brown, writes a, a college football one using these. And of course, like, I don't think any, especially a model that's going to display, you know, 65 to 70 games a weekend, you know, you don't want to blindly bet those. And right. so, as you said, the, the process is you go in and you look and, and you sort of immediately look at places where your model, you know, would, would tell you have an edge. And then you do a little bit more research and, and, you know, whether it's like injuries or, you know, there's specific spot stuff that I don't think any model can incorporate. I think there was like, you know, the, uh, uh, Kurt, uh, Peterson in, in Washington always has Washington State's number. That's not something you can like put in a model and it would be robust. Um, but there are you other, could put you know, it in the model. <laughs> you could. Yeah. And then yeah, I don't want to and would be like five. Right. So then and, <laughs> so it would be a tough thing to sort of robustly put into a, a predictive uh, system. So, mm -hmm. you know, you add that to your handicap or you lay off games because, you know, there might be um, you know, there might be extraneous factors that you haven't put in, but it, it's certainly the first place I look. And then after that, uh, I, I sort of look at, you know, maybe where the market's moved and all that kind of stuff. So well, is Eric, that mostly wanna, it? Go ahead. Go ahead. Eric, Eric, Eric I want to point out just the, the way that green line is different from a lot of what you see elsewhere, including on my site, you're building this based on player grades that PFF is making based on charting studies. And that makes it a lot different from just looking at team statistics <clears throat> so can you give us an example of maybe a team where like your ELO grades are different from what other people have based on team numbers? Yeah. So for example, like Cal, I believe is like 15th in the AP poll. Um, and, uh, and that, and we don't have them ranked. I think we're, they're in the thirties for us. Uh, and in, you know, you, you, you talk about our ELO system. It's basically the way that we do our first order power ranking, you know, generally speaking, like that would explain about 75 to 80% of the variance in the Vegas spread. And I can't remember the exact percentage of the actual outcome of the game. Uh, and the way that we build that is we take our, our PFF player grades at the college level uh, and we basically reverse engineer what the score of the game should have been based upon that. And then we put it through an, an ELO system. You get a power ranking uh, and, and you move on. And I think with Cal, what you have here is a couple things. First off, you know, their quarterback, Chase Garbers, hasn't particularly played well. I think he's only completed like 
uh, I got to look here, uh, like six passes over 20 yards downfield uh, all season. He's got a great PFF grade below 65, which isn't particularly good on any of those plays. They just don't get chunk plays from the quarterback position. Uh, and quarterback is the most important position, even in college football. It's less mm-hmm. so than in the NFL. Uh, and so like our model is always going to sort of grade them worse in a game that maybe they even win uh, than, than uh, you know, the box score itself or even, you know, yards per play type of stuff, just because we know that certain things carry. Uh, and then in addition to that, we do a huge adjustment for what conference you play in. Uh, and, and so, for example, the Pac-12 has been weak over the past year plus. Uh, and so that, you know, in that regression, every team in the Pac-12 has moved down a little bit just because there are going to be other teams that are stronger than them in other conferences. And that gets to like a team like Missouri, where we have them, uh, I believe, yeah, I think Missouri's in our top 25, which is super mm-hmm. surprising given that they lost to Wyoming. But our game grade for that game didn't have them losing to Wyoming. Uh, and then they've had, th- you know, three pretty big uh, wins since. And then uh, also they play in the SEC, which is far and away the best conference in college football. So they just like that rising tide lifts that boat. Something we've seen a lot recently is a lot of, you know, backups playing. Do you feel that because it's a player based model, you can have more confidence when we have changes within personnel, do you feel better about the model knowing that it can account for that? Uh, to a degree, you know, but the difficulty, and this is what makes to me, like you, I lean away from some, you know, overreacting to injuries a little bit in, in college football is it's very difficult to define what a replacement level player is in college right. football. You know, we have, we built a wins above replacement model for the NFL. Uh, and that was, and that was something where I think we're pretty decent at defining replacement. Uh, in college football, I think a replacement level player with respect to Alabama is a is an all star on FAU, you know, so it, it's super hard to sort of, you know, and then uh, and then when you get into intra conference play, like how does that, you know, how do how is that different than inter conference play? Uh, and so, you know, for the quarterback position, I think we have a robust way of sort of uh, weaving people in and out. Um, but at other positions we're you know, we're very, we regress quite a bit when it comes to injuries, when guys are out, uh, we don't know, we try not to overreact too much. Sure. All right, let's move on here to our first game. We're talking about for week five in college football here with Dr. Eric Eager, pro football focus talking Notre Dame versus Virginia. The spread in this game is now Notre Dame minus 12 and a half. It opened at 11 and it has shifted since then. The total here is 48 and a half Notre Dame. Didn't play that badly against Georgia, uh, kept it a low-scoring game, and kept that game close. Did that Georgia game for Notre Dame do anything to change the way you view Notre Dame at all going forward? Yeah. In fact, I think, you know, we have Notre Dame with something like a 6% chance of running the table this year. Uh, And in those instances, they make the college football playoff about half the time. So they, you know, that game they very much like, I think, I can't remember what the full game grade was, but they were far closer than the, the, the score of the game would indicate, even in covering a two touchdown spread. So it was a good, it was an impressive victory or impressive victory against the spread for them and a, and a loss overall. Um, but uh, so it does, it does increase for them. We have them as the sixth ranked team in the country still after that game. Um, but in this particular matchup, I think with that 12 and a half point spread, we would lean a little bit towards the Virginia Cavaliers here. Interesting. And Virginia is undefeated here. So, you know, definitely their biggest game so far. What pushes you towards thinking that Virginia can keep this game close? Uh, per- I mean, Perkins is a player that, you know, at the quarterback position who, you know, he has struggled so far under pressure. His passer rating when under pressure is less than 55 NFL passer rating. Um, you know, he has had some turnover worthy throws, but, you know, those are a little bit less stable. His passer rating when clean is about 105 and we know that that carries a little bit more uh mm-hmm. than you know on a on a game to game level than when he's pressured and when you add to that his ability to sort of like you know make plays you know with his legs i think that's a you know I, I, something that i think can keep them in the game especially when you think about athletic athletically i don't think virginia is like worse than notre dame i think notre dame's more of a you know very tactical team uh unless it you know going to athletically blow out a team like virginia ian book's been great <laughs> Um, but I think he's been buoyed a little bit by some, you know, unstable things. If you talk about with Perkins, you know, under under pressure, his passer rating is 55, books is 85, and those t- things generally tend to regress a little bit more towards the, you know the 65, 70 range. So uh, just a little bit of uh, fading noise a little bit here, and I just think the number's too big for a team in Notre Dame that's far more of a close. You know, the total in this game is you know less than 50 in college football. So it's sort of hard to sort of square both of those things. And, and in which case, I kind of like the underdog here. 
Yeah, Eric, thanks for talking about the Notre Dame's win out probability. I think a lot of that has to do with those road trips to Michigan and Stanford don't look as tough as they did uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, let's move on to uh, Clemson at North Carolina. Clemson's a 26 and a half point favorite. Uh, before getting into this game, would love your thoughts on Trevor Lawrence in terms of your player grades, a uh, guy that isn't lighting it up like you did at the end of last year, uh, some interceptions going on. What do what your numbers say about Trevor? Yeah, he's a player actually whose passer rating under pressure is a little bit higher than when clean. And that's something <laughs> that, you know, okay. is very unstable. And when we look at the quarterback position, you know, he was starting out with the first game against, I believe it was uh, – Wake Forest, I believe, but he had like a, a turnover worthy plays on in the first half numerous times. And that was something that we didn't see at the end of the season last year, especially against Alabama uh, later on. So when I look at that, I'm thinking to myself, you know, uh, either I, he improves fundamentally or some of this noise where his passer rating, you know, when under pressure is, you know, above 90, above 100 even. Like if that regresses, that offense might not be as explosive. On the other side, you know, their EPA per run play is over a quarter of a point uh, and, and they run the ball half the time. So there's sort of that like floor for that offense that I think uh, will probably carry for them. Um, it'll be interesting though, when they get into these games, you know, obviously they'll probably play an sec opponent in the playoffs if they get there, which we have over 90% chance that they will uh, whether they'll be able to compete if Lawrence is not the player he was a season ago. Yeah. And right. that's going to be interesting to watch too, because it could just be, you know, a situation where he's underperforming in the pocket and the, the, the more volatile number, maybe the more predictive one here, but it's, it'll be interesting to track for sure and see how that goes. But their opponent here in UNC allegedly got off to a hot start. Uh, Ed was talking about how there was some noisiness in their win over Miami. Uh, they've kind of regressed pretty heavily since then with back-to-back -back losses. Do they keep it close enough to cover in this one with a spread of 26 and a half for a home game? Yeah, UNC was, you know, the model like UNC the first, I believe, three weeks, and mm -hmm. they came out of that two and one, both straight up, and I believe against the spread, I think Wake uh, backdoored them in week three. Um, mm -hmm. But here, uh, you know, after losing to Appalachian State, the model is not is going to adjust significantly in that situation, especially at home. Uh, young quarterback is sort of still getting his, um, you know, feet wet. Uh, I think Clemson is a team that's probably, you know, especially at this 26 and a half. I know, you know, numbers greater than this. It's hard to call them key numbers, but 27 and 28 are pretty key out here. Um, I if I'm if, I, I probably wouldn't bet on this game, but if sure. I had to, I'd probably lay the points with Clemson. Yeah, okay. and uh, it'll be an interesting one to watch. I think the larger the sample gets on Lawrence, it's, it gets more interesting uh, because it's been it's been an interesting start to the year for for sure for him. Uh, let's move here to Ohio State against Nebraska. A little college game day action out in Lincoln. Uh, Ohio State, 17.5 point favorite. The total here is 67. And Eric, you got your PhD out in Nebraska, so yeah. we, of course, had to include this game. Pretty big game to begin with, though. Uh, but before we talk about Nebraska versus Ohio State, What's your overall impression of Nebraska so far in year two with Scott Frost? You, you know, it it was one of those things where I, I thought that the end of the season was very encouraging for them because, you know, they, they couldn't have gotten off to a slower start, losing to Troy last year, uh, you know, getting blown out a few times by some of their, uh, you know, Big Ten opponents. I thought their game against Purdue – um, where Purdue kind of got out in front of them, but the Nebraska sort of hung with and kept scoring and and showed a lot of their potential offensively. Uh, really, you know, boded well for them down the stretch, and they they were kind of impressive down the you know on the stretch run, uh, especially in Big Ten play. Um, but then this year, I thought that they were a little bit overrated, and it started you know immediately when they were you know multiple touchdown favorites to South Alabama and couldn't cover that game. Probably should have lost, frankly, if they didn't get defensive touchdowns uh, and special teams <laughs> touchdowns. Um, you know, I thought, you know, against Illinois, I didn't think they were particularly sharp or impressive on the road. Um, you know, they've had, they've had some success in those middle games, but, uh, for me, I, you know, I'm, I'm bullish on them long-term. I think this year is not going to live up to, you know, people in Lincoln's expectations of them. But frankly, since I started going to grad school there in 2008, the Nebraska Cornhuskers have never lived up to Lincoln people's <laughs> expectations of them. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and what about the team on the opposite side of the ball? Ohio State has looked pretty good, putting up big margins of victory against lesser competition. Uh, Justin Fields looked pretty good at the quarterback position. Thoughts about Ohio State and whether they can uh, cover 17 and a half points on the road? 
Yeah, absolutely. When when Ohio State drops back to pass, they average almost half an expected point. So that's uh, extremely good. Um, we have these things that are akin to touchdowns to interceptions, but they're big time throws and turnover worthy plays. And they are sort of the more predictive versions of those. Um, Ohio State's 10 to one in that ratio. Uh, which which is tremendous. And, and they're avoiding, not only are they making big plays in the passing game, but they're avoiding turnover-worthy plays, which are the sorts of plays that can really hurt you if you're trying to cover a big point spread like this. Um, you know, they're over 150 pass rating as a team, uh, you know, uh, when clean. So they're just, they're humming offensively, uh, positive EPA per rush. So, uh, you know, top, top offense in the Big Ten, second best defense in the Big Ten in terms of our ranking. So they're a team to be reckoned with here. And uh, if the SEC wasn't so strong, I think that they would be, you know, it, it win out there a relative shoe in for the college football playoff. Yeah. And uh, Justin Fields has been fun to watch. Uh, the numbers for him really good, but I'm watching as more of like a casual fan. You know, to the trained eye, how has Justin Fields looked? Uh, what is Pro Football Focus's impression of him so far? Oh, he's he's graded extremely well. Uh, the you know the big time throw to turnover worthy play uh, stat is really going to be you know something that we look at. And and it, and the thing that's tough is like you look at a guy like Dwayne Haskins who you know sort of hasn't gotten on the field yet for Washington. He was a player that got a lot of, I would say expected points on like expected throws. So throws that we would give them a, a zero grade or an expected grade, um, you know, because it was some of those touch passes or those crossers or uh, things like that. And he was certainly a good prospect, right. um, but, but he sort of left us wanting more with the lack of sort of, uh, you know, explosive plays. I don't think that'll be the case with fields. And Terry McLaurin and, uh, and Paris Campbell can lead to a lot of explosive plays, which is kind of what you were alluding to there. Yeah, yeah very much. I never bet. Go ahead, Ed. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, so you're, are you not surprised that he hasn't gotten the job in Washington based on what your grades were last year? Uh, well, like I, I, our, our raw numbers considered him sort of more of a tier two quarterback in college football last season, mm -hmm. only because wow. of, only because of the Ohio state's, uh, the, the offense is very comfortable, you know, is the way I like to put it. Um, he got rid of the ball very quickly. Uh, he, his average depth of target, I can't remember exactly what it was or where it, you know, his distribution was, but he got a lot of, um, you know, essentially expected points on what we would consider non NFL throws. So throws that you'd mm. put in a bucket of plays that sort of even Blake Bortles at the NFL level can make. <laughs> Excellent. Eric, before we let you go here, any other bets you see on the board that you like for week five of college football that stand out to you when you look at green line and things like that? Uh, yeah. So, and I don't know if this is the consensus line or not, but, um, again, I've seen it at some at 72, but I like Texas tech versus Oklahoma is over. You know, I, I don't <laughs> think you could ever go wrong hoping for points in a game like that. I know, uh, against UCLA, they didn't, they didn't put it on the pedal and that game went under, but even opening night against Houston, that got over the closing number at 80 or 79 and a half, I think, um, if it's if it's out to 72 73 i'm a little less uh, bullish on it but if it's at 70 and a half which you know i think our consensus number is i i'd like it um the other one that i like i like fau at charlotte fau's plus one um i think charlotte is a little bit overrated uh because the three of us could probably go out uh, <laughs> you know and and ha and have success last week for them so um, that's, that's another one I like FAU, uh, I think without turnovers would have blown out, you know, we had them, I think two weeks ago and I, and they, they covered, uh, pretty convincingly. And I think without turnovers, they probably would have won by four touchdowns. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and you always know that Lane Kiffin sort of has the, has your, <laughs> has, has your, um, uh, back as a better. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would agree with that assessment for sure. Uh, Texas Tech and Oklahoma at FanDuel Sportsbook, 70 and a half. So right at that number and uh, taking the over there. That is Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus. You can find him on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric. Eric, thanks for stopping by. Um, we'll be rooting for the Cornhuskers for you on Saturday. Hopefully things go well with that one. Appreciate you stopping awesome. by and uh, good luck uh, for college football and the NFL this week. A lot of fun, guys. Thanks for having me. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Dr. Eric Eager for swinging on by and previewing week five of college football. And, and I feel like we could have been very selfish and kept uh, Eric on for a very long time. Um, but it's really fun information. And it's yep. it's fun to hear other smart people talk about things like this. I, I, I just geek out getting to like listen to you guys go back and forth a bit. 
Yeah, no, Eric is the best and uh, really love the way that he's taking all these player grades, which is really different from what a lot of other people like myself that are, you know, using play by play data to make these projections. Uh, I think there's a lot of value in seeing what he comes up with. Right. And we talked about the player based model with Rob Bazola, too, and kind of right. the value in that, uh, some of the difficulties with that, which is what Eric talked about, too. Yeah. But I, I think it's a very interesting approach because, again, I'm we talked about this with Rob, but like. I like to consider situation and I think you can consider situation better when you're accounting for the players. And I love that the player based model does that. I know it's like so hard to do because there's so much change across right. college football, across the NFL. But uh, I think that it's a really interesting way and having the data that pro football focus has to help you with that, I think is, is phenomenal. So fo follow Eric on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric and add a little plug for football analytics show. Uh, you can hear more about his research on the football analytics show. I think you had him on over the summer, uh, but I thought I it, was, it, it was a more expansive listen about things we talked about at the beginning there. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was early September. Um, mm -hmm. cause I think we did talk some teams and stuff, but um, you know, the football analytics show is a little bit different because I like to talk a little bit more about the numbers and the insights. And, you know, I mean, there's betting on there, too. But. Right. And and like I just like it because it, it, can, it can like let the nerd out a little bit. Like I like that. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a less time constrained thing where you can actually like expand on those really interesting things and dig into those. Uh, so I'd recommend finding the football analytics show. If you search Spotify for Eric Eager, it pops up right away. Um, Ooh, excellent. Yeah. So Good I info. would recommend that. For sure. Uh, if you want to find the best lines and the best value in betting on games, look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have developed over at numberfire.com. Oddsfire is a premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first party fan duel data all in one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on Numberfire or at oddsfire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's dive in now to covering the future, starting off with you, Ed. We're talking more college football here. You want to talk about Penn State and potentially getting an edge on this team. And it's an edge you said we may not be able to get for much longer. Yeah, I mean, it's actually really talking about Maryland, their opponent on Friday night. And uh, I think it's a good opportunity to uh, fade Mike Lotsley. He <laughs> is the new head coach. Uh, really had a, a horrible time at New Mexico as the head coach. Uh, has rehabilitated his career at Alabama, rose up to be um, Nick Saban's offensive coordinator last year and got the job at Maryland. And they came storming out of the gate, uh, looked really good against Howard and Syracuse, and then finally kind of came back to earth two weeks ago against Temple. But to put those games in perspective, you really need to account for strength of schedule. Um, so Maryland had eight yards per play against Howard, which is great, and they put up a lot of points. But it, Youngstown State had 11.2 yards per play against them. Hampton had 6.7 yards per play against Howard. And one of the things that I'm able to do is adjust for strength of schedule, including those FCS opponents. And so when I do this, um, I mean, I'm actually taking all games in which both teams are either FBS or FCS. So essentially, I have like the whole network of FCS teams in order to Maryland, yeah, in order to evaluate Maryland at this point of the year, and you know it doesn't particularly look good for Maryland. So just based on four weeks of data and three games for Maryland, you know their offense is 56th in adjusted yards per play, their defense is 75th. So while the scoreboard looked pretty good against Howard and Syracuse, um, my numbers aren't really loving that team. And Penn State's been pretty good so far. I kind of forget that, you know, both my preseason metrics, both my data-based model and my market-driven model had Penn State as a top 15 team. Uh, so far this season, uh, they're actually third in adjusted yards per play based on just uh, this season. Uh, not quite as good on defense. They're 61st. Uh, you know, maybe we'll see if they're not as good because of, you know, losing a couple of guys in the secondary to the NFL. But a lot of people expected that defense to be better. But essentially, you know, when all come it's down to it. Like they've, they've lived up to their billing as a top 15 team so far this year. Uh, my model says that Penn State should win by nine on the road. James Franklin has no qualms about late game scores to cover a spread. Uh, I would definitely take uh, Penn State, I think minus six and a half right now. 
Yeah, it is. Um, and that number is actually seven at a couple of other places, thanks to Oddsfire. I can tell that very easily. Uh, but it's minus six and a half right now at the FanDuel Sportsbook. And right now, 80% of the bets and 72% of the money are on Penn State. So if you want to get six and a half, it's probably wise to dive in there, I would say, given that it is seven at some other spots. And the other thing, too, I think with Maryland to keep in mind is that win against Syracuse has gotten worse the more Syracuse has played right. in 2019. And also, that Syracuse game, I think it's important to remember, that was the game before Syracuse played Clemson. And the talk that entire week was, if Syracuse wins this game, college game day will be in Syracuse for the first time ever. And I was listening to the pregame shows on Saturday morning. That's all I talk about. I didn't hear a word about Maryland. It was all about <laughs> if they win, they're going to, you know, college game day will be at the Carrier Dome. And so I think that there are a couple of reasons to knock that that win against Syracuse down, and then you're kind of on thin ground for being super jazzed about this Maryland team. So I agree. I think that um, people are coming around on it based on that Temple game, but maybe not fully there yet. So I think it's a pretty smart way to view things there too. Yeah, and I, I don't think there's going to be this kind of value on Maryland going forward. I think I think they're they're going to they're going to lose, and and we'll you know I mean it, it's going to be Maryland. You can only take advantage of early season inefficiencies for so long. And right. uh, I think it's smart to get in with them there. Again, Penn State minus six and a half right now at the FanDuel Sportsbook. Now, my covering the future, we don't have odds yet uh, up yet on the FanDuel Sportsbook, but that's for the Charlotte Roval race for NASCAR. And we talked about NASCAR before the road race at Watkins Glen. And I love betting road courses because lines are always terrible uh, for road courses, to be fully frank, because sportsbooks tend to overrate performance at road course. And I think that based on odds I have seen some other places, there are a few drivers who look a bit undervalued to me. One of them is Kevin Harvick, who was 14-1 to 1 at Westgate when their odds opened on Tuesday. And he's actually number one in my model right now. I would not rank him there personally because Martin Truex Jr. has won three of the past seven road course races. He could have won the other four as well. He was runner up twice and then got wrecked uh, or had mechanical issues in the other two. So he could have won seven straight. So Martin Truex Jr. should be the favorite, but Harvick being first in my model at least is interesting to me. Uh, 14 to 1 seems a bit too long for him there. He's always been awesome at Sonoma, which is one of the road courses. He had an eighth place average running position in Watkins Glen this year, which has never been his strongest track, but he also has good equipment and he's a very good driver. So I think that 14 to 1 is just a bit too long, no matter what his road course record may be. So Harvick at 14 to 1, very interesting. I also like Daniel Suarez and Matt Benedetto. Uh, they were both 80 to 1 at Westgate, and now the guy's in the playoffs. So what we're going to see on Sunday is a lot of drivers prioritizing stage points, which is good for them. It's very smart if they want to advance in the playoffs, but it also will lower their expected finishing position if they prioritize that over track position to start off the next stage. Di Benedetto and Suarez aren't in the playoffs, so it doesn't matter for them. They can just worry about the finish. Di Benedetto, fourth and sixth in the first two road course races. He has been awesome all this year at tracks uh, that have had additional off-throttle time, which will be the case this week in Charlotte. And he almost won at Bristol, another track like that. He has three top fives overall this year, all of which have come since that Sonoma race. So I think Di Benedetto makes a lot of sense. Juarez doesn't have the best record on road courses in the Cup Series. Did have top fives in Watkins Glen earlier in his career. He also ran well on road courses in the Xfinity Series, but Last the races for him haven't been that inspiring, and that's going to let you get some value on him from a betting perspective. But he's had a top 15 average running position in six straight races now, which is awesome for a driver who checks into 80-1. to one. So I think that Di Benedetto and Suarez, normally you don't want to bet on guys who are 80-1 to one in NASCAR because they don't win very often, but this is a high-variance track. We saw Rex in practice last year leading into this Charlotte race. So I think Truex probably going to win this week. He's crazy good, but it's a high variance track. So I'm okay with dabbling in some longer shots. And I think that Harvick, DiMenedetto, and Suarez are all longer than they should be. So odds on FanDuel Sportsbook tend to go up Thursday morning. I would check out where they are then. But I think those are the guys most likely to get some action. And I would expect them all to probably move before this race starts. I think that Harvick is very interesting at 14-1. to 1. Uh, do you have any idea what the NASCAR playoff system is like? Because it's very weird, and I feel like it's so hard to explain it to anyone. I, I don't. Uh, so it's like they have 
four separate rounds. There are three races apiece, and they're they're the trim the field is trimmed after each three races. So oh. this is the end of the first round. There are currently sixteen drivers in the playoffs. There are still forty drivers in the race, but there are only sixteen drivers who can win the championship. After this race, they lop off four of those guys. It's only 12 guys onto the next round. It's a very weird format, uh, but I think that in these cutoff races where guys need to prioritize stage points, and there are a lot of drivers who are in that that bubble uh, for this week, we can find some value in the guys who don't have to care. And Harvick is one of them because he's already clinched. And then uh, Di Benedetto and Suarez both so far out that it does not matter. Uh, they're out of the playoffs. So I think that there is some value there for sure. Uh, Ed, that's all we got for today. Um, you are over at thepowerrank.com. Um, anything go- good going on over there this week? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can get a hold of my uh, email newsletter. I'll be talking more about some of these adjusted college football uh, yards per play numbers, get some early insights uh, into what teams look like. Yeah. Um, and then also had Rufus Peabody on the Football Analytics Show. So that is out. Uh, he's a professional sports better. Always a good conversation. A uh, lot of uh, interesting tidbits there that he gave out. So and check that out. Uh, you can get that all at thepowerrank.com. Yep, and the Football Analytics Show is wherever you get your podcasts, too. I listen on Spotify, like I said, but I listen to everything on Spotify. So it just makes it a lot easier when I'm going from my uh, computer to my car. You can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank as well. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald for producing the video side of things for today and keeping us on the air as always. Big thank you to Dr. Eric Eager of Pro Football Focus for swinging by and talking about week five of college football and all of his research into pass rush, offensive line play, quarterback play. Big thank you to him. Follow him on Twitter at PFF underscore Eric. Big thank you to all of you as well for tuning in for today. Don't forget tomorrow to check out our NFL week four betting preview with Whale Capper. That will go up tomorrow. Subscribe to Covering the Spread to make sure you get that podcast right as it goes up. We'll talk to you then. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 